Hello everyone, today we talk once again about mm, monasticism during uh, Carolingian and post-Carolingian times. Um, <coughs> I came often on this topic in my in previous videos and discussing essentially the development of the um, um, secular and ecclesiastical lordship um, <coughs> in the frame of um, high medieval Europe, especially during the 9th and 10th centuries. Um, today I would like to um, address um, a bit uh, a more comprehensive topic relatively to the uh, development of monasticism starting from, from Carolingian times and covering essentially the um, the, the following century, and um, <coughs> it is uh, essentially the the unitary role that monasteries um, had um, uh, in uh, in this time of European history, not just as uh, cultural centers that obviously pr are you know famously also produced um, a great deal of um, of artistical and literary. Um, uh, works of, of the uh, of, of Christian Europe of this era, um <coughs> but also and especially from um, a political and social point of view, uh, broadly meant, but always in in a unitary term that th that was essentially the one um, that the Carolingians had tried to uh, to create uh, um, um, in, in order to strengthen in turn the unity of their own empire that was um, uh, already a miracle in, <laughs> in many ways uh, considering uh, Frankish political culture and especially its relation with um, with, with concepts of um, public and, and private um, uh, authority um, so let's simply get into the matter so uh, starting from roughly the 9th century, so and, and the beginning of the 9th century, so the peak of uh, Carolingian unity, uh, all the um, in all the within all the territories that were under the imperial rule of the Franks, monasticism so um, a, a very important uh, growth, um, and the monasteries <coughs> basically became the custodians of the um, of the culture can say without uh, further specifications and the propagators of faith in those areas of um, more recent uh, evangelization um, so when we talk about culture we are obviously referring to um, especially the, the famous copy of work of copy of those uh, manuscripts uh, containing um usually uh classical pagan um and and christian um authors and and also obviously the so-called patristics that is the, the the commentary to the mm, uh, the fathers uh, of the works of the fathers of of, of the church so uh, as you understand it was um it was still reflecting um a relatively you know, simple horizon, uh, considering the, at least the, the older um, um, ancient world relatively to, to, to the interest for knowledge, etc. It was still um, strongly framed, uh, firmly framed into a, an essentially Christian perspective, also because the, <coughs> the, pa the pagan authors that had survived um, at that point uh, in their works uh, were essentially um, had managed to arrive at that point simply because uh, during the late antique and early medieval period um, they had been uh, maybe qu um, quoted by um, eminent uh, ecclesiastical figures that therefore had seen uh, within the, the, the immense uh, and classical pagan world obviously sparkles of wisdom of of um of of models of knowledge that that could be integrated into the Christian one, but even within this relatively limited uh, amount of knowledge, which you know it would be still impressive to know today um, for a single person, definitely <coughs> there was a um, a great work of interaction of criticism towards the literary works, 
um, you know, um, that reflected the widening of the horizons that um, the Europeans were starting to have after the, the centuries of, of, of stall that had characterized, you know, politically, socially, economically, and also culturally uh, as a reflection the um, the early medieval um, centuries. Um, <coughs> but as we uh, were saying, this corresponded also to um, the the broadening of the actual geographical horizons uh, of the Europeans, because the Carolingian Empire had indeed expanded even into uh, territories that um, had not known Christianism, or that at least had had not been yet um, Christianized. And therefore the monastic centers, and this is evident especially in, into these frontier areas, were, um, you know, had a, a, a much greater importance in terms not just of Christianization but also of spreading of, cu of cultural models that um, the same Christian culture of the time was impregnated with. Um, so for instance, in the newly um <coughs> acquired uh, Carolingian Saxony, um, um, there was um, um, the foundation of very, um, uh, uh, indeed of brand new, but also extremely rich uh, monasteries, like the one of Losch and uh, Reichenau. There are beautiful, still existing parts, um, and um, um, that became cultural centers with a sort of, of of missionary um, uh, aim broadly meant that it's not just um, a mere, you know, um, um, ability of um, of spreading the, the Christian message, but also making it uh, di and digestible for peoples that essentially had not even um, <coughs> a written culture uh, and at that time so that there would be a great work of mediation of um you know of of even of uh, of renewed uh, ethnographic interest for which um you know the saxons were definitely an interesting people now that then they had become carolingian subjects so that uh, the monks living in these monasteries would, would look back at the ethnographical models, especially the ancient world, like Caesar, Tacitus, etc., that had been deemed uh, as great odors to, to survive into the Christian tradition. Um, <coughs> and, um, and what is important to, to think here is that um, this, um, this process of acculturation and of, um, through the, the monastic um, tool uh, had been uh, something actually planned, um, politically speaking, um, by the Carolingians and especially um, by the figure of uh, Louis uh, or Ludwig, uh, depending whether you want the, the Latin or Germanic uh, name, uh, the Pius. So this uh, famously the son uh, of, of Charles um, the Great and um, the um, the sole ruler at a point uh, in the Carolingian Empire. The Carolingian Empire had this huge uh, fortune for it for, for for the very existence of itself that um, both um, Charles the Great and uh, Louis the Pius um, basically remained at a point without uh, siblings that could contest their rule because you know that the Carolingians used to split the uh, paternal um, heritage um, in, in um, you know, uh, um, among the, the, the various sons. So obviously remaining a single male son was a pretty good, it was also risky for the empire in, certain, in a certain sense, but it could, s um, you know, in, in, in a larger perspective it was the, um, a very good chance for the individual um, uh, on the throne because he could really plan um, a type of politics that was much less prone to accept compromises with other, um, you know, relatives that claimed power. Um, <coughs> and, uh, and, and these two sovereigns, incidentally, uh, had also a very long uh, reign. So this meant a lot in a moment like that in history. Um, <coughs> because uh, there was enough time to carry out certain 
politics policies um, and um, and effectively making uh, your your plans you know at least going uh, without in, um, interferences then obviously <laughs> things could go could go could go wrong but that was um, uh, you know uh, on, on on the person's intelligence and definitely both Charles Great and Louis de Pierre's represent probably the most advanced um, um, civil experience of the uh, of the of the Carolingians, let's say, but in general of, of Frankish history, in the sense that father and son uh, conceived um, the Carolingian Empire as something unitary, and something that had to be centralized on a Roman model um, in order to escape the centrifugal force of the um, of the Carolingian nobility that instead um, had basically no um <coughs> You know, intention at all to to lose um, its prerogatives in favor of, of a more centralized power, and um, and the church in this sense and was the um, the the uh, the most proficuous tool to use because the church was not private or better in practice it was because <coughs> abbots and bishops were still drawn from the um, the elite from the Carolingian ruling class. But the ecclesiastical institution wasn't. The, uh, the ecclesiastical institution was much stronger, um, independent from Rome's uh, already and largely, at least at the beginning of this period. As we will be saying, there would be a detachment with the crisis of the and the fall of the Carolingian Empire. But it basically was um, a model that mm, was thought um, uh, not just ideal. Um, idealistically but practically to last without um, corruption <laughs> as a system. A corruption meant m materially speaking, uh, metaphysically we could say, because these people also, this is an interesting perspective indeed, but uh, the Carolingians showed also quite a lot of pragmatism, so obviously were quite uh, hard reasons for um, for believing, uh, you know, for for betting on on the church um, as um, uh, the uh, administrative um, agent within the the Carolingian Empire it was uh, essentially a personally meant thing since the times of Clovis. Um, so um, the church in this offered, and especially the monasticism offered a great model. Because at that time, as you probably know, there was just one monastic rule. There was the Benedictine one. Um, <coughs> obviously, um, yeah, the Christianity was already largely expanded, um, so there would be essentially a, lo a lot of differentiations within the same local um, monastic communities. And and um, and, uh, and and these indeed had a, a, a big influence in in shaping the um, this we can what we can call the imperial monasticism that was um, um <coughs> uh, enhanced by uh, by Louis de Pierce. Um but um, being there a, a single rule, things were probably easier to you know. Um, to 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 um, you know, I, I, it was easier to make it work homogeneously because there wasn't much debate on, on which rule to obey, at least uh, on on the Benedictine, Benedictine basis. Um, and um, the um, and, and as I was saying, however, it was an influence from certain traditions, and uh, Louis de Pierre's um, um, you know, chose expressly the um, Bene Benedictine rule as it had been interpreted and essentially modified by uh, the famous uh, Visigothic um, uh, monk Benedict of Anian. Um, he, um, uh, this rule had been chosen because it had sort of unifying factors within it. Um, and um, and therefore, I, Louis de Pierre's tried at least to make it uh, accepted by all the monasteries of the empire. That, <coughs> as you understand, was it was a very large one. So it it did have um, he did meet some resistances in in the process on on local 
mm, on the base of the local monastic traditions. So with the Council of Aachen uh, of eight, uh, 816, um, there was these um, triumphing, at least seemingly, this the triumphing idea of an imperial monasticism, um, and uh, the um, uh, the Benedictine, um, r um, the reformed Benedictine rule, um, um, came to um, to become uh, uh, the the unifying factor into the into European monastic life. Obviously, <coughs> there was, as we were saying, was a lot of resistance. There was a lot of you know different parties we can say that obviously also corresponded sometimes to uh, not just to, to the interpretation of different interpretations of the rule but of political uh, interests even even per national interests because uh, you know uh, uh, there were traditions um, of, of um, of this um, in the interpretation of these rules that had something um, you know, national in it. The same um, Benedict of Anian was w w was um, <coughs> the interpreter of a Visigothic tradition that could have been different from the one of uh, of, of Italy or um, the one of, of other regions of the empire. Um, and it is interesting also in this perspective that the unifying factor um, was um, essentially uh, deriving from um a choice that the um <coughs> that the emperor made um in the pool uh, of the various options that arrived from the various uh, traditions existing within the empire um so the the centralization um of the process here is, is evident you know the the Carolingian rulers wanted at this time to um, um, avoid problems uh, in the uh, structuration of of, of uh, the monastic um, uh, communities, um, and uh, and this was going on together with uh, with a broader reformation of the uh, churchly practices because the, the Franks had basically, especially when invading southern Europe, had acknowledged the uh, the extremely unsatisfactory education of their own um, clergymen who could barely read uh, Latin, <laughs> for instance, and often misinterpreted the same um, holy scriptures. So um, it, it really corresponded to to bigger picture, a um, uh, bigger vision that the, the Carolingians had in mind to to make uh, their empire something. Uh, more, um, you know, more better functioning, let's say, than they um <coughs> than w than it was, and um, as I was saying before, also conceiving uh, the um, the church as a valid, um, uh, cent um, you know, centralization model that um, basically already existed within their territory and that could be uh, expanded at the expenses of other uh, private powers. Um, and um, um, however, um, the um, as you know, you know <laughs> uh, things went wrong <laughs> for the Carolingian Empire. The, din the dinosaurs seemingly had uh, their own <laughs> death coming from from the skies. Uh, the Carolingians had actually um, actually slaughtered each other. <laughs> um, you know, and if you really want to understand the uh, the reason why the empire fell, uh, it was mostly internal. Just like with the uh, with the Roman Empire, it wasn't much that external um, threats coming to destroy it, but essentially the same uh, internal structure uh, weakening itself for. Uh, internal dynamics, and uh, however, um, the decline of the Carolingian Empire, just like uh, uh, the one of the Roman one, uh, uh, were um, exploited immediately by other peoples, uh, raiders mostly, that uh, came to you know to devour uh, the uh, uh, the the dying body of of, of 
of the empire. So between the, <coughs> the 9th and, and 10th century, um, the same monasteries, uh, during the collapse of the Carolingian Empire, um, incurred in, in very heavy dangers because um, they were extremely wealthy uh, places, they were usually endowed with um, very large and productive properties, um, and they were uh, hit uh, remarkably hard by the um, raids of the Hungers, the Normans and the Saracens. Um, the Saracens managed even to um, to violate the uh, uh, St. Peter in, in 846 and St. Paul too in Rome, so um, this was also seen as a very uh, dark um, moment for Christianity, for, for uh, um, not just the Western one, um <coughs> and, uh, and a sort of divine punishment uh, uh, in many ways, and uh, and if uh, the basilicas of St. Peter and St. Paul had been hit, it, it, it followed that any other center of the uh, of Christianity was was in danger and uh, in danger, and and so <laughs> it was effectively, I'd say, um, uh, just think about the, the the case of England, where basically the Danish uh, incursions. Um, uh, hit uh, to death all the uh, local uh, Benedi Benedictine monasteries for, for decades and ininterruptedly, so um, uh, there was an actual uh, problem. Obviously England had not been part of the Carolingian Empire, but um, uh, the, uh, the, the Benedictine um, monasticism uh, expanded even beyond those borders and and we can't say that even even the English monasteries, with all their differences and local traditions, were part of a greater um, European net of uh, of monasteries that um, suffered uh, equally the same problems, and that therefore had to find um <coughs> a collective answer to to this problem. Um, so um, uh, the main problem for finding this answer, uh, however, was that um, the uh, political um, authority had collapsed. So um, the those who were meant to be the, the protectors of the monks and of the of the church in, in general, that is the the emperors and the local aristocracies. Um, were kind of you know uh, weak and uh, uh, incapable of, um, of of giving substantial help uh, most of the times. So um, uh, the, um, uh, the the one of the consequences of this crisis was that the same monasteries began to um, essentially to to arm themselves. Um, against the external threats, and this was achieved also because uh, the papacy um, was um, exploiting the um, the crisis of the um, the political crisis uh, to um, extend even more, always always more um, intensively on the secular matters and in controlling. Um, uh, all the various um, uh, religious communities, even at a very long, uh, long distance. Um, but uh, this was difficult without a political, um, a, a political connection. So uh, that was cut off at that point. So at the same time, the papacy strengthened, uh, you know, the prerogatives of the church but it kind of lost control at the same time of the same uh, religious communities for some time. So that outside of Italy, it was difficult for the Bishop of Rome to have an effective control of, uh, of monastic communities. Monastic communities that therefore were left alone and, um, and, and began to participate, uh, especially at this point, into the um, the political game of the uh, local realities, meaning that um, there was really <coughs> um, 
not a great difference between um, a monastic uh, domain and one of a, of a local um, aristocrat, secular, secular lord, um, because the um, the revenues uh, and the basis of power in this sense were were essentially the same. Um, it was land. At uh, this time, there were obviously certain markets that were and and trade um, that were developing, but the the second invasions had contracted that um, for a while. So um, the the local uh, monasteries tended to um, to set um, uh, root into the especially the local political affairs and um, and through their um, uh, you know, charismatic and religious prestige, especially within the masses of, the of believers. Um, so um, the um, the, the in, in um, uh, we, we don't have to think that in this sense the uh, religious life was uh, in crisis as well. But on the contrary, um, the ability of the monasteries to interact with local realities meant that. Uh, the various abbots and, um, and, and, re and and religious communities in general uh, were m m tried um, basically they, they managed to become more resourceful on, on the local base and to um, uh, equip themselves with certain uh, political and, and even military weapons at a point um <coughs> um, in the um, to to uh, to engage uh, uh, in their I initiatives, the the local the local communities. So um, uh, this happened through you know various means. Uh, one was obviously the um, um, the the donate the, the same way of of self um, you know of increasing their own. Um, Properties, not through warfare or or occupation of land, that sometimes was achieved, especially when when political authority was uh, was vanishing. But especially through donations that came obviously from uh, from anyone, for especially the the suffrage of of the dead and, uh, and we're talking about very consistent donations of lands or privileges also of economic nature of, of local uh, seigneurial rights that were uh, left in the, the testaments of people who in, in turn asked um, and, um, prayers for for their souls for when and, and the one of their relatives for when they, they, they would be dead and this is something that really had um, you know, very ancient origin because obviously the church um, immediate was immediately created with a sort of uh, you know of, of concrete material base in which to organize itself. But um, in in such a um, as, as well as after the um, uh, um, the the fall of the Roman Empire, after the fall of the Carolingian Empire. Um, the church saw um, a great moment of expansion because it, it basically could could occupy those um, those empty spaces that had been uh, um, left by uh, the fall of the political authorities. So this implied um, naturally extending also a very concrete temporal power over certain territories and uh, creating uh, lordships on their own. And would would be checking that, especially because um, um, the churches sometimes were, um, you know, they had one. Well, we, we will be talking about it when we talk about bishops later. But for now, let me finish this. Um, uh, substantially. Um, uh, the and and I would like to talk another about another aspect now that is more strictly, you know, uh, cultural and um, um, that is the, um, the very important role that the monasteries had during the times of the, the so-called second invasions. 
um, in keeping um, a net, uh, keeping alive uh, um, a net of links uh, between all the um, the various communities. So not just the same monasteries that remain in this sense um, uh, during the fall of uh, during the, the the absence of the um, <coughs> of the political authority capable of remaining o of perceiving themselves as a, as a structure of uh, of uh, you know monks that had therefore a role that, that was starting to go beyond the simple um, contemplative life but ha uh, was gaining responsibilities towards a lot of other communities that lived first of all under them because obviously monks um, monasteries owned lands that on which there were peasants who, who worked and uh, lived and worked and they had to be defended they had to be given you know a, um, a future in, in many ways um, and that Wu therefore um, uh, might have been some of the few I can't say unitary but one of the few um, u uniform uh, institutions existing at that time because these Benedictine monasteries were scattered literally, uh, uh, literally all over Western Europe so uh, they um, they were very thick net um, and they um, and, and, and um, through this net th there were um, there were really lots of exchanges that um, were also quite varied think um, first of all it was normal we, we have this sometimes the prejudice that monks didn't travel that once they enclosed themselves into the monastery walls they would not go out anymore well this is true for many of them but not for all of them uh, as a matter of fact the monks um, sometimes were sent uh, studying learning in, in other monasteries um with the decline of the um of the public authority in, in these times there would be a lot of uh, a lot of monks of abbots uh, also so people of prestige of some in uh, even of some ed very consistent education that would be used for instance for diplomatic missions so they first of all this implied uh um uh, a relation with the political local political powers uh, that even you know implied also certain mobility a certain capability of you know of of knowing the um, of knowing society outside the monastery walls um, and it also implied um, sometimes even the uh, the discovery of other uh, uh, words of other um, cultures uh, in many ways. If you look at the uh, geography uh, of this time and all the literary production that um, that um, that it entailed, you realize that these um, uh, monks had a actually huge knowledge about the, the surrounding world and even um, beyond the boundaries of the same Christian world. I mean, there were news and, and, and knowledge that really flowed in, uh, through these monasteries about the uh, <coughs> about the East, about the Muslim powers, um, about the the far North that the the Carolingians had um, had begun to 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 scope with their expansion. So, uh, I mean. Not that they 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 wouldn't know that the Carolingian world wouldn't know the northern world otherwise, but th there was a renewed interest. This is what I mean from a literary point of view towards um, the um, towards a universal perspective that was always at the center of the Christian mindset, but that now was um, uh, enhanced, uh, expanded, and s uh, substantiated um, with actual knowledge and informations about the um, uh, about the, uh, the, the outside world. Um, consider also that monasteries were not inhabited and frequented just by monks. There were also a lot of people working there. For instance, um, those um, um, specialized workers that were able of um, uh, of creating illuminations 
sometimes were obviously monks in their turn, but sometimes would be even laymen who were paid by the monastery to illuminate that manuscript. Um, and this means that the monastery gave a job to people, um, to people that therefore could move from a monastery to another and um, to transfer uh, to transfer knowledge, to transfer uh, techniques, um, to transfer awareness and simply, you know, co communicating with, with the monastic communities. Um, and therefore, um, you know, you can argue that um, the the monastic world at this time was in expansion, it, which is a paradox considering that the rest of the world was pretty much messed up. Um, and yet, the monks lived at this time a sort of privileged um, um, experience, uh, as especially as protagonists of the uh, spiritual life of Europe. Um, and, um, and you have to think, naturally, that um, uh, at this time there wouldn't be many other uh, centers of knowledge, especially in Northern Europe where there, there were not um, urban centers or they were at least, or they had decayed, or maybe they, they were being built from scratch only uh, at that point. Um, you know, the, the, the monastery, even just as, as a physical thing, as, uh, as a building, was a very important center. It was a point of reference for local communities in, in many ways, and it was a pole that attracted um, many people uh, in many in many different ways. So um, the um, um, uh, the uh, and and you have to think, as I was saying before, also that the connections with the um <laughs> with the headquarters of Rome um that had al always uh, tried to direct the monastic um especially the spread of the monastic uh, world and um of the monastic communities and the evangelizations etc at this point uh, wasn't much in contact with, it, with especially with those newly uh, founded monasteries of of the north um, which means that uh, these monasteries would have even to to conceive themselves as as autonomous uh, heads, as as communities that were evidently, by as it was demonstrated by political practice, uh, free to 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 wage certain policies and to um, and to be able to to find new solutions to concrete problems that were happening there and on which Rome uh, at that point could, could not intervene. Um, and, and we have to think that um, in this process the same monastic rules became to be um, to be modified uh, because um, yeah there was a unifying conception of, of um, and the, the the unifying idea that um, the, the monks in Western Europe were essentially all Benedictines, but um, with the f uh, after the effort of centralization made by the Carolingians, now uh, the the uh, same fall of the Carolingian Empire was pushing f uh, towards uh, you know a, a new um, um, differentiation and. Um, and and um, and detachment from all the various um, regions that had been part of it and were kept together by a unifying power that didn't exist anymore um, at that moment. And um, and differently from um, uh, from the monks. Uh, the bishops of, of these centuries, and especially also of the 11th one, uh, were probably um, even more, um, you know, um, even freer of political uh, and even military action than the monasteries, because the monasteries more or less had um, a certain idea of the world that was essentially replicating within their own com isolated community the perfection of the um, heavenly Jerusalem. Um, 
So they were smart men, but they they also had mm, very peculiar horizons. Bishops, as always, had and uh, and and urban clergy in general had instead a very different life because they they if anything they lived immersed into um, political matters in 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 uh, uh, in, uh, in first hand um, most of you uh, as as everybody knows um, the um, the dioceses um, of um, of Europe were based on uh, on cities. This had been the normal uh, pattern since the, the Roman Empire, so um, bishops had always remained kind of more um, engaged into political matters, even at uh, at a larger scale than, than abbots, for instance. Um, and especially they had a, a much different lifestyle. First of all, these people were uh, more likely compared to the monks to be aristocratic uh, in origin. Um, this is truer the more you go south in Europe um, and um, and vice versa um, less the more you go north and th there is a reason for this that is in, in, I in Italy or southern France or in the Spanish mark um, the um obviously cities were much more developed than in the north um and um and this and and, and these territories had incidentally also been um the, the most peripheral ones uh, at least from the perspective of the um the core of the um carolingian power that was essentially this area b of, of benelux between France and Germany, especially northeastern France, that instead was uh, a less urbanized area. That in France there were, uh, even in northern France, there were consistent cities, but they, they were weaker, and there were more powerful uh, rural lords than in the south. Um, so, um, historically speaking, since the times of, um, uh, since the beginning of the Middle Ages, um, these uh, regions of, of of southern Europe were richer, more populated, more urbanized, better educated, and and and, and more far um, of reach from the um, the Merovingian power of, of northern France. So, uh, since um, with the collapse of the Roman Empire, um, you know the, the local um, aristocracies, um, you know had sensibly weakened and the only aristocracies at that point were the ones of, of the clergy. Um, bishops had had in these more urbanized areas um, um, essentially the uh, the full temporal powers over local matters. Sure there were certain other um, uh, aristocrats of lay um, of laymen um, but usually um, bishops had an enormous power that uh, quite often even uh, exceeded them. Um, and the same Carolingian elites with the reconstruction of the Frankish Empire had integrated these um, um, e clergymen into their into their elite. Um, the same Carolingian dynasty descended f famously from um, um, from the, the, the Bishop of Metz uh, that is in Central Europe. Um, uh, and um, and you can understand uh, how, in many ways, these um, bishops were first of all mm, figures of very high profile uh, because they were wealthy, they were educated, uh, they were powerful politically. They had their own uh, clients, uh, armored retinues, so they were they were very v mundane people. And um, and 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 sadly, from a Christian point of view, they were also not very spiritually, um, uh, you know, <laughs> um, uh, interested in in their in their role in the sense that uh, uh, you know their spirituality and religious life were 
quite uh, quite low in many ways, um, and uh, and they resembled much more the 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 average lay aristocracy than than anything. They they made war. They went hunting. So they um, they uh, they obviously had um, you know children wives and uh, because at this point before the Gregorian reform there wasn't even a strict law that said that clergymen couldn't be married um, already at that time it was seen as something negative in the sense that the Christian practice basically had already said that if you are married you're kind of more uh, influenced uh, emotionally and passionately by your relation with your wife etc so you could technically still be uh, legally from from a Christian perspective uh, a married bishop but um, chance was that someone at least wouldn't think very good of that <laughs> um, but evidently these um, bishops didn't didn't care about it because they were essentially aristocrats so they also fed a lot of people um, and uh, and their success was the success of their clients so there was also society backing this um, this aristocratic um, uh, li not just lifestyle but ambitions and practices um, and um, and the bishops would just see their office as uh, you know a, a source of revenue nothing else um, that, at, that at some point um, uh, the uh, you know considering also and especially that this office uh, very often was bought with money so they, they had got it for much and they, they, they were expecting to make uh, to, to make um, income through it that would exceed the, the sum they had paid to, to buy it um, so this this attitude obviously um, um, was seen in, in certain sense even as, as a normal thing you know yeah I was saying that spiritually speaking there, were, there might have been someone criticizing that but we don't have to think that it was something so strange for the mentality of that time in certain places it had always been so so you know it, that didn't at least surprise anyone um, and uh, yet it, it had been conceived as intolerable by the Carolingians um, and probably in, in turn not because they were so shocked by the lifestyle of those bishops but because they saw um, this pretext to um, confiscate much of their goods that they had um, um, been able to uh, to occupy during the absence of the um, Frankish um, power uh, in in those peripheral regions, and now that that uh, they were taken once again back by the imperial rule, this is the reason, by the way, why um, Charles Martel suffered a very bad press because he was uh, the first. W well, we really don't know whether the first one or not, but surely the beginner of this very um, you know steady practice of alienating of confiscating uh, the properties of these so-called bishops that uh, originally belonged theoretically to the Frankish king and that during the the, the, se the centuries of uh, crisis of the Merovingian monarchy had been simply occupied, occupied by, by those uh, aristocracies. Um, and that's by the, by the way the reason why uh, at a certain point the Carolingians also were capable of entrusting um, and fearing uh, with so much um, uh, entrusting so much land uh, their local uh, th their military retinues it, it's because they had got back all this huge amount of uh, supposedly ecclesiastical land um, from from these <laughs> bishops so that that obviously used it in, in very different ways from the the at least largely from from the the actual episcopal um, duties and um, uh, and yet however I don't want to to describe in such harsh terms the uh, episcopal class of these um, of these areas also because objectively uh, 
they were behaving like all the other aristocrats, so they probably even weren't uh, such, you know, depri depraved per people. You know, they were simply, you know, doing what other people did. And we don't have to forget that they were still um, uh, the point of reference of local communities. So they had a very high cultural level, they knew how to guide the communities. Um, 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 they, they obviously had uh, conjoint interests with the communities. Even though um, in the, in the uh, rural areas the monastic power was always greater than the Episcopal one. So you can find even um, a sort of, of competition and, um, and differences of cultural models existing between bishops and, and, and abbots that um, were, you know, source of uh, of attrition in some ways, and uh, they simply represent two different means. But it's still important at the end of this video to remember, you know, um, the most important thing that is that there were clergymen that during the eclipse of the imperial um, power managed to extend enormously their powers and that um, uh, this in turn allowed them to, um, to, to enrich themselves with new political, social, economical and cultural tools that eventually made civilization in turn. <laughs> so all things, uh, all reasons for which we can admire these beautiful monasteries all over, all over uh, Western Europe, al also Eastern Europe has. Now we weren't talking just about the Carolingians, but um, where we can look at beautiful illuminated manuscripts of those times. Um, that's why we um, we know so much about the past centuries, thanks to the monks who very patiently. Uh, copied all these manuscripts, made them circulating, and in turn brought their own um, um, works and reflections. Um, and, uh, and and we have to thank them also because <laughs> they were, at this time, usually the, the only sources you can find historically, uh, especially in Northern Europe, and, 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 um, and it is still um, uh, very important um, you know, in spite of all the differences that all, all the time separates us from, from these people, to really understand their perspective um, and to to read those sources into this perspective. So always reflecting on why a source is written in a certain way. And, um, and that's, uh, unfortunately, sometimes our only way to really understand uh, or to partly, very very partly understand at least a tiny bit of that world for 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 what we can do so um okay i don't know how much you followed but uh yeah this is pretty much what i wanted to say um i hope you enjoyed this video and um if you did uh please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you have any question feel free to leave a comment and uh as always, I thank you very much again for listening. I wish you a, a nice time and see you next time. Bye.